We're now going to look at the issue of profit and loss calculation. The point of this unit is to help try to explain why government planning doesn't always succeed. The core ideas here were first presented during the socialist calculation debate, which took place in the first part of the 20th century. After the communists took over the Soviet Union, there was a claim that planning or central planning would be more efficient than capitalism. But two economists from Austria, the first named Ludwig Mises and the second named Friedrich von Hayek, who later won a Nobel Prize, they both argued that central planning would not be nearly as efficient as capitalism with its system of market prices and profit and loss. The Mises-Hayek argument was that businesses need access to market prices to determine which courses of action are profitable and which courses of action are not profitable and thus should not be pursued. To put this in the context of a concrete example, imagine a business which is considering investing in a new computer system. This new computer system will make the factory safer, but there's still the question of whether this new computer system is at all worth the money. Let's say that to develop the new computer system, what's needed are 20 computers, 5 additional programmers, 3 marketers to help sell the system to factories, and 5 engineers to hold the whole thing together. When combined, these inputs will produce exactly one more system to monitor factor, factory safety. But should this investment, in fact, be undertaken? Well, here's where the socialist calculation debate comes in. If all you do is list the inputs and the outputs, and you have no access to market prices, we really don't have a very good idea whether this new system is cost-effective. Maybe it's costing us a lot more resources than we're going to get back in return. Now let's consider that same estimation when market prices are present. Imagine, for instance, that each computer costs $1,000. That means the computers run to about $20,000. Each programmer costs about $80,000. Five of them runs to about $400,000. The marketer is at $60K a year, $180K total, and four engineers at 100,000 times four means 400,000, and you add up all those costs, and what you get is something about $1 million. So those are prices on the cost side, and you then want to compare that to your total revenue, and you can ask, is the total revenue more or less than $1 million? And if the revenue is a lot more than a million, well, maybe it's a good idea. If the total revenue is, say, much less than a million, only 200000 then probably the project is a very bad idea, and this process of calculation with market prices, it's highly imperfect and highly prone to error, but still it gives you some basic starting point for trying to figure out how should resources be allocated and when is a new investment a good idea. Centrally planned economies don't have access to these kinds of market prices, and thus central planning generally tends not to work. Of course, not all forms of government intervention take this extreme path of using central planning and abolishing markets and prices altogether. What's more common is that government activity is in some ways embedded within a system of prices and wages, and the government in some manner tries to improve on the operation of private capital markets. So let's say, for instance, that we're back to our computer system that will make the factory safer, and this costs $1 million in terms of investments, and what we see is that in the first year, it yields $200,000 in revenue, and there's then the question of, well, might the higher revenue come in the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and so on, and the govern government may feel it can do a better job of forecasting that future revenue than can private capital markets. There are still major problems, however, with government intervention in a lot of these cases. Private capital markets really are trying to forecast future profits and losses. When politics is being superimposed on private capital markets, very often a company or investor feels it cannot so easily go out of business or that its future prospects depend upon its ability to get more money out of the government rather than by producing a product that will satisfy consumers. There's also a tendency to run with projects which maybe don't make economic sense because they support jobs or because they bring money to a politically favored district. For these reasons, when a political process has some access to market prices, it's still the case that that process will experience a lot of difficulty in trying to calculate future profits and future losses. 
Sometimes when a political process sets the price of a good or service which is being sold, it tends to set that price too low. So to view this in terms of a supply and demand diagram, here's price and here's quantity, here's a demand curve, here's a supply curve, here's the level of market clearing, well the political incentive often is to put price somewhere down here, and that means demand will be quite high relative to supply, and there will be a shortage in the market, but what the political process tends to do is to hand out that good or service in accordance with political favoritism. This was common in the Soviet Union. Most prices were set too low. There were extreme shortages, say, of meat. But if you were well connected with the Communist Party, you would have a relatively easy time getting meat because you would get it through your political connections. And the price was held artificially low precisely to create that shortage so the people who were controlling the allocation of meat could trade that meat for favors. So part of the problem with the socialist calculation debate isn't just that governments face difficulties when trying to calculate the right prices, but that very often, for public choice reasons, governments aren't even trying to calculate the right price. In fact, they're trying on purpose to get the price wrong and perhaps set it too low for political reasons. The argument here is to explain why governments face such difficulties in trying to get investment decisions right. But the argument is not that governments always get such decisions wrong. In fact, you can find cases in histories where governments have done a pretty good job getting investment decisions right. Consider, for instance, the industrial policies of the nation of South Korea. During the time of South Korea's most rapid economic development, government played a significant role in allocating capital, and overall you can debate how good a job they did, but they certainly did not hold back the economic growth of South Korea. Given the socialist calculation debate, well, how is this possible? One way to think about what happened is to think that perhaps South Korea had a lot of market prices, especially wages, which initially were at the wrong level. That is, South Korean workers were going to be extremely productive and do very well educating themselves and producing things, and these productivities were not really adequately reflected in market prices. So South Korean labor was extremely cheap. So if the government then charged ahead and supported a bunch of investments, even though the government really isn't generally good at calculating exact estimates of profit and loss, the government was dealing with a lot of underpriced factors, in this case labor, and so a lot of investment decisions, which maybe were simply thrown forward, ended up being very good ones, and they ended up being investment decisions which supported economic growth. When some key factors in your economy, such as labor, are very much underpriced, it's relatively easy for a lot of investment decisions to pay off, including government-run industrial policies. This is a highly complex topic with a lot of different angles, but for more information you could just start by googling socialist calculation debate.